B Please note, this episode contains references to war and violence. Please take care as you listen. It took the Taliban four tries to catch Mohammad Jawad Khan. But one afternoon in September 2021, they finally succeeded. The first time they came looking for him, the fighters didn't enter the house. Instead, they seized the family's bulletproof car and the AK-47 guns carried by their security guards and then left in a rush. Jovid's family had a security detail because his brother was a member of the Afghan parliament and Jovid worked as his aide. Jovid was proud to advocate for human rights, democracy and girls' education. But the Taliban had long seen him and his brother as collaborators, part of an illegitimate government that couldn't survive without American support, and they were eager for revenge. So when Kabul fell, Jawid went into hiding. He stayed inside, and to pass the time, he read novels, classics of Afghan literature. They were full of tales of family conflict and forbidden love, war crimes and unlikely heroes, and epic journeys to find freedom. Over the next few weeks, the Taliban showed up at Jawid's house a second time, and then a third. They pounded on the doors and demanded to search the place. Jawid thought he was done for, but somehow his mother managed to convince them he wasn't home. He had no future in a country ruled by the Taliban. And it began to seem like nothing short of a crazy voyage could get him out of Afghanistan, the kind he had read about in books. Jawid had been in hiding for nearly a month when the Taliban appeared outside his family's house again, yelling for him to come out. This time, they ignored his mother's pleas and barreled inside. Jawid could hear their heavy footsteps crashing from room to room, and he knew his luck had finally run out. The fighters wrapped a blindfold over his eyes and tied his arms behind his back. They marched him outside like a criminal and pushed him into a waiting car. Jawid heard the rumble of the engine and then his mother's cries, fading further and further into the distance. From Project Brazen and PRX, this is Kabul Falling. I'm your host, Nilofar Hidayat. This is episode six, Terrible House. By September, the chaos of the summer was over. In Kabul, bulldozers tore down the concrete blast walls that had partitioned the city into a labyrinth of fortresses. Laborers dismantled coils of wire and hauled away beds of rubble. Shopkeepers threw out female mannequins and covered advertisements that displayed the faces of women and girls to avoid the ire of the Taliban's morality police. Soon, the first passenger flight permitted to leave Afghanistan under the new regime landed in Doha, Qatar. It carried more than 100 foreigners, including American, British and Canadian citizens, who had been waiting to evacuate. But for tens of thousands more Afghans, whose work and beliefs placed their lives in jeopardy, the nightmare continued. The car came to a stop, and Joe had heard the doors open. He had no idea where he was, but the Taliban pulled him out of the vehicle and tossed him into a cold, dark, dirty basement. For the next three days, they tortured him. Everyone who wanted to beat someone, they used to come and they wanted to beat me and they beated me a lot. They interrogated him about his finances and his work in the government, punctuating each question with a slap, a punch or a kick. How much you are having in your pocket, in your bank account, in your home... How much your brother have, from which uh, intelligence uh, country you are working with. The Taliban accused Jawid of being a covert CIA agent. They tried to get him to confess to crimes he hadn't committed. But Jawid didn't waver. He'd served his country and was firm in his conviction that he had done nothing wrong. Why should I lie to you? What is the truth? I'm telling you the truth. 
It felt like they had a thousand questions and a thousand ways to terrorize him. Even the lowest ranking fighter became a fearsome commander when he stepped inside Jawed's cell. The Taliban screamed at him. They pounded him with their fists and their feet. They hit him in the face, leaving a sharp, lingering pain in his tooth. Jawed soon lost track of time, but it seemed like every hour another fighter appeared to dole out a fresh beating. Then, after three days of constant torture, they let him go. Later, Jawid learned that a group of elders from his home region had intervened using their tribal connections to request his release. During the early days of Taliban rule, with the rest of the world paying close attention, the regime didn't want bad PR. In public, its leaders were making promises of reconciliation. They assured Afghans who had worked with the Americans or served in the government that all would be forgiven. Here's NBC's Richard Engel speaking to Zabiullah Mujahid, a top Taliban spokesperson. Not everyone is going to be able to make it out. Will you let those people leave in the future? Can you guarantee their safety? We don't want our countrymen to go to America. Whatever they have done in the past, we have given them amnesty. We need young, educated professionals for our nation. Jawid did not want to test the limits of that policy. As soon as he was released, he fled Kabul and went into hiding. He was far from alone. Thousands more Afghans were hiding across the country, moving from house to house to evade Taliban capture. After he fled Kabul, Jawid travelled south to lay low in Ghazni province, where he had relatives. He did his best to blend in with other villagers. A week passed without incident, but Jawid knew that he would not be safe as long as he stayed in Afghanistan. The Taliban had told him as much when they let him go. If we see you again, they said, you know what will happen. Jawid took that to mean they would kill him. One of Javid's brothers had escaped from Afghanistan to Abu Dhabi with the help of Dana, the Israeli-American journalist you met in our previous episodes. In our last episode, you heard how she helped a group of 42 Afghans escape north through Tajikistan. And now, Dana was once again busy helping several others. Of course, after the first evacuation, we got so many requests. I mean, so many. I wake up and I have hundreds of WhatsApps from people asking for help. Jawid's brother explained the situation and Dana agreed to help. She texted Jawid on WhatsApp and told him to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. Dana was clear. She could not help Jawid's entire extended family. There was only room for eight people. So they had to make life or death decisions. Who would get a chance to escape and who would be left behind? Soon after, he received a message with instructions. In this in the today night you have a journey toward the border. Like you have to go to Tajikistan, then from Tajikistan, we, we have a plan for you. Dana and her team had planned out the journey. First, his family would take a bus to Kunduz province in northern Afghanistan before making the last leg of the trip to the Tajik border. That night, they set out under the cover of darkness. Jawid and his family travelled through the night, their bus jolting constantly over the bumpy, poorly paved roads. The group of 124 people Dana was helping to evacuate arrived just after nine in the morning. She had connected Jawid with a man who brought them to a temporary safe house, but he quickly realised the place was not safe at all. It is just the name safe house. It was not a safe house, it was a terrible house. The terrible house was a crumbling old building and it looked like nobody had lived there for a long time. But now it was stuffed with people. 124 people in one house, just two rooms, two bathrooms in one basement. There were no beds and there was no water. The man told Jawid they would only be there for two hours and then he'd take them to the border. But two hours turned into four. The terrible house was hot and airless. Jawid felt dizzy. He has epilepsy, 
and when he doesn't get enough sleep, it can trigger a seizure. He'd been awake all night. There was thousands of thinking in, in, in fear, uh, which was with me because I was taking the responsibility of the whole family, which was seven people. Then, around four in the afternoon, Jawid heard commotion from the street outside. The Taliban had found them. Jawid and his family shuddered as the Taliban pounded on the door of their so-called safe house. Locals had tipped them off after seeing so many unfamiliar people in one place. Half a dozen fighters descended on the house, calling for the men to come out. They demanded to know who all these travelers were. Jawid had no choice but to comply. I give my name in my place, in my state, my village. Some of the women started to cry. Outside, the men stood shaking. When the Taliban figured out who had brought everyone to the house, they beat the man mercilessly. Eventually, they let the men go back inside. Jawid's baby daughter, who was just six weeks old, was burning up with a fever. His wife begged him to get help. He pleaded with the Taliban to let him go to the shop nearby and get some medicine, but they refused. Around six in the evening, as the sun was beginning to set, a group of Taliban fighters came back into the house. They beat a few of the refugees. When they got to Jawid and his family, they screamed at them to get out or be killed. They hustled out of the terrible house. Jawid's wife had some distant relatives in the city who agreed to host them for the night. The head of the household offered some spare blankets and let the family rest. It will okay, 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 you sleep. And believe me, that was the most greatest gift in my whole life someone gave it to me. Jawid lay down and finally he fell asleep. Jawid awoke after 11 hours of deep slumber. After the family's long journey and their day in the terrible safe house, he needed every minute of it. Dana had a new plan. The group would take a bus to mazar sharif another city in the north of Afghanistan, several hours away. From there, they would charter a flight to Abu Dhabi. There was a slim window to fly out of Mazar airport, but it seemed safe. A certain Taliban leader who usually is at the airport was going to be at a wedding for those two days, so we had a really good chance of taking off. Meanwhile, Dana was busy dealing with another problem. There were over 100 Afghans in the group she was trying to evacuate, and 44 of them did not have passports, including Javid and his family. How were they going to board a plane without passports? She'd run into the same issue with the previous group she had gotten into Tajikistan, which included the female robotics team and the cyclists. By several small miracles, Dana and her contacts had managed to cobble together a solution. It's a bit complicated, like a lot of Dana's evacuation stories, so stick with me here. A family friend of Dana's was once married to the Israeli ambassador to Washington. That woman happened to be friends with the wife of the Afghan ambassador to the US, who'd been posted to DC at the same time. The former Afghan ambassador to Washington had then become the Afghan ambassador to Moscow and was in Moscow. Now the Taliban was in charge and he was no longer the ambassador, but the Taliban yet hadn't sent their own person and he was there in Moscow with the keys to the embassy. Dana's Afghan contacts in Moscow managed to get the passports printed for the first group to fly out of Tajikistan. They were all made on the very, very same day without any biometrics. They, don't, they look a little flimsy, but they are real passports. Dana was hoping the same playbook would allow them to evacuate the second group of Afghans. They sent all the required information to Moscow. The former ambassador and his team printed out dozens of passports in the embassy. Then, they sent them across the Tajik border into Afghanistan. And then, on the other side of the border crossing, the Taliban confiscated the documents. Dana ran through every contact she had, looking for any way to get them back. She and her team called many important people, but at the same time, they asked the Afghans they were helping if they had any contacts with low-level Taliban at the border. 
we first of all searched high and low for really basically uh, connections to the Taliban at the border back in Kunduz so that we could get our passports back. We were busy calling Tony Blair and the governor of Kunduz and all that. That didn't get us anywhere. After their bus arrived in Mazar, Jawid and his family waited on tenterhooks. They were so close to finally getting out of Afghanistan, but without passports, they were stuck. Javid was standing outside a small shop one evening, several days later, when Dana called. The flight she'd chartered to Abu Dhabi was leaving 36 hours later, and it looked like it would be taking off without them. Wait, he told Dana. So I said, can I try something? Dana told Javid she had already tried everything to get their documents back from the Taliban, but she was keen to hear his plan. Uh, president of Tajikistan called to the Taliban and they are not giving. How can you do it? Jawid knew it was a long shot, but he was the one on the ground and he knew that he'd regret it forever if he didn't try to get those passports. I said, OK, we'll try because if I try, don't get, I won't feel bad. But if I don't try and I don't get, I will feel bad. She said, OK. Dana agreed and Jawid hung up the phone. Now, it was up to him. Jawed needed to get 44 passports from a Taliban leader in Qunduz. Eight of those travel documents were for his own family. He'd fled the area just a few days before, after the Taliban stormed into the terrible safe house and told him to leave. But... He also had a connection to the Taliban who might be able to help. Even now, I can't believe how it happened. And even if I tell you, you wouldn't believe that how this thing can happen like this. Jawid had a friend who had a relative in the Taliban. And that Taliban member had a connection to Maulawi Sahar, a regional Taliban leader. So Jawid called his friend for a big favour. Could you ask your relative to call Maulawi Sahar and ask him to facilitate the return of the passports? At 8 o'clock on the night of September the 28th, the evening before the charter flight from Mazar to Abu Dhabi, Jawid's friend called with good news. The Taliban leader agreed to hand the passports over. Jawid was shocked. His crazy plan had actually worked. There was one condition. After Jawid collected the passports, They never wanted to see him in Qunduz again. It was an incredibly risky trip. Driving from Mazar would take between seven and eight hours overnight through rural areas across mountains. Going to Kunduz to the border has thousand percent chance to be killed. Jawid's wife pleaded for him not to take that chance. She didn't want their infant daughter to grow up without a father. Her own father had died when she was just two months old. But Jawid told her not to worry, that everything would be all right. He didn't really believe that, but he had to say it. Jawid texted Dana to let her know he was on his way. He would be travelling with another man Dana was also assisting to evacuate, whose family's passports had been confiscated too. Jawid kissed his daughter, grabbed his phone and some money, and set off. As he stepped out of the house, his wife and baby were both in tears. Even my small one in half man daughter was crying. It was like a signal, giving, through, giving a signal something will happen. Jawid headed to the bus station where he found a man driving a beat-up old car and asked him for a ride. The guy asked Jawid why he needed to travel so far in the middle of the night. Jawid made up a lie. His father had just been in an accident. The driver agreed. When they got on the road, Jawid could barely see where they were going. The car's weak headlights were of little help. The driver told Jawid it would be fine. He knew each and every metre of the road but Jawid remained uneasy. He couldn't sleep. Each kilometer of that road was like, I am going to die. Jawid was scared of the Taliban, the rural area they were traveling through, the mountains, even the driver. Every half hour, 
he texted Dana with an update. Midway through the drive, around 2am, two men standing in the middle of the road stopped Jowett's car. Even under the light of a full moon, he couldn't be sure if they were Taliban or just thieves. They asked Jowett where he was heading and again he lied about his father's accident. The men allowed them to pass. Later, they reached a checkpoint and this time, they were Taliban. They stopped the car and questioned Jawid and his driver about some recent robberies in the area. Jawid was terrified. The scariness of the whole world came to my heart. The darkest night in my whole life was I was just experiencing in each and every section with fear. What would his family do if he didn't make it back alive? At 4.30 in the morning, Jawid arrived at the border. An armed Taliban guard approached him. He said, who are you? What are you doing here? Jawid explained he'd come to retrieve the group's passports. The man told Jawid to wait. Maulawi Sahar was asleep, but he would be up in an hour for morning prayers and Jawid would join him. Jawid went back to the car to try to get some rest. I slept for half an hour in the car. And then he knocked the window and he said, OK, wake up, it is time for prayer. Jawid followed the Taliban guard to the mosque. His western dress and hairstyle drew plenty of stares. When we came out, everyone was looking to me, that who is this, with this beard and this clothes, who, who is he? As prayers came to a close, Jawid asked which of the men was Maulawi Sahar, the Taliban regional leader he travelled all night to see. The guard pointed to a man with a big turban covering his head. Jawid introduced himself and explained that he was the person from Mazar who had called about the passports. He said, oh, very nice, you are very smart. But soon the exchange turned ominous. So he was asking directly the same question, where are you going, America? Are you doing human trafficking? How much you are taking for the passport? Jawid explained that he wasn't trying to make money off some human trafficking scheme. He only wanted to save his family. But the Taliban leader kept asking, how much was Jawid going to profit? Who had he met with on his journey? The leader looked Jawid up and down. Jawid got the sense that he didn't like what he saw. Maybe it was his trimmed beard or his clothes or the way he talked, but he tried to keep his cool. Jawid explained that the passports had been printed in the Afghan embassy in Moscow. He didn't want to sound like he was showing off. The Taliban didn't like things from abroad. Well, except for Kalashnikovs, M16s and Humvees. But fancy cars, flashy sunglasses and Western-style haircuts like Jawid's, those were for foreigners, not Afghans. And the foreigners weren't here anymore. Maului Sahar looked at Jawid and asked him, don't you think you are so smart? Jawid said he wasn't smart. He was just a man who was desperate and needed the Maulawi's help. Maulawi Sahar repeated his conditions. Jawid could have the passports as long as he never showed his face in the province again. Or you will not be seen in the whole state of Kunduz. It was a deal. The Maulawi called over a teenage boy and told Jawid to follow him to the border post. When they got there, the person he needed to speak to was sound asleep. No, they couldn't wake him up. They'd just have to come back later. Jawid had risked his life to make this journey. He'd prayed alongside men who resented him, or maybe even wished him dead. He'd answered their questions, absorbed their abuse. He had to see his daughter again. He had to get back to Mazar. He had a flight to catch, and dozens of people were counting on him. Jawid stood firm and demanded the passports. The Taliban guard taunted him. He asked Jawid if he thought he was smart, just like the Maulawi had, and just like he had before, Jawid said no. Playing dumb was the best way to handle the Taliban, he decided. Otherwise, they'd give you an even harder time and ask you even more questions. Jawid and the guard argued for a while. The man didn't want to give him all of the passports. In the end, Jawid convinced him to hand over nine of the 44 passports. The man travelling with Jawid was also able to secure six passports for his family. He texted Dana a picture of the passports. She started laughing. She couldn't believe it. When she got the news, 
Dana was in a hotel room in Dushanbe, still working to coordinate evacuations. A staffer from Isra Aid, the organisation Dana partnered with, captured the moment on video. <laughs> Gavin, you are amazing. No, I don't know. For nine passports, only nine. Okay, but I told him to do it. I told him to do what he could. Oh my God, Javed! I can't believe it. I am so happy for him. He'd actually done it. The impossible thing that even the president of Tajikistan hadn't been able to convince the Taliban to do. Joe had turned the stack of passports over and over in his hand. Had he really pulled this off? Or was he about to wake up from some kind of crazy dream? I couldn't believe, and I shake myself, but I might be sleeping, or I might have got it in sleep. Now, he had to get back to Mazar and onto the airplane. There was no time to waste. He made it with just a few hours to spare. He embraced his wife and baby daughter, and they got ready to go. Then, at the airport, after everything he'd already been through, Jawid faced yet another obstacle. The passports he received from Moscow didn't have an official signature. The Taliban guard checking their documents wouldn't let them through. And they say the passport is fake. Jawid stood for over an hour, doing all he could to convince the Taliban that these were real passports. Finally, he and his family managed to get into the boarding area and squeezed onto the plane. The last last it. A realization washed over him. It was actually happening. They were finally leaving Afghanistan. The plane took off, and just 45 minutes later, it touched down in Tajikistan. Jawid was confused. They were supposed to be going to Abu Dhabi, where his older brother was waiting for them. They sat on the plane for another two hours, wondering what was going on. After all that, were they going to be sent back to Afghanistan? Finally, the group was allowed to deplane and enter the Dushanbe airport. Dana was there to greet them. She spotted Jawid and his family and rushed over to give him a big hug. She was just shouting, Jawid, Jawid. You are the champion, you did this, you did this, you did this. She was hugging me, she was not letting me go. On the next episode of Kabul Falling. I started my undergraduate degree, but by the time I finished my first semester, I turned to my dad and I said, I'm going into Afghanistan uh, and I'm going there to fight. Every intractable conflict is is born to a narrative, a version of the truth, right? Hi, I'm Lucy Woods, managing producer of Kabul Falling. We wanted to thank everyone who has sent a voice message via our website to share your own experiences and tell us your thoughts about the podcast. Please keep them coming. We love receiving them. This week, we would like to share a voice message from one of our listeners, Mariam. Here it is. Hello, this is Mariam, and I'm speaking from Providence, Rhode Island. And I have to say, I really like this podcast, and I thank every one of you for collecting and documenting the stories of people, because we really need voices. I was also one of the evacuees from Afghanistan and I'm not really good at putting into words what I had experienced and have experienced for the past one year. But all I know is that I still cannot comprehend the fact that my body is in another continent and not in Kabul where I love dearly but the Kabul I used to know is no longer there because I liked Kabul and Afghanistan for the people for the family for the friends for the shopkeeper I used to see every day when I, when I go to work it's really hard to accept that there is a very low possibility of going back to the life I had before August 15, 2021. Afghanistan is there, Kabul is there, 
it's safer because Taliban they don't need to explode the building or attack somewhere because there is no foreign forces to fight against. But there is no democracy. There is no girls going to school, going to workplace, going to cafes, going hiking, bicycling on the road. These are not possible at all now in Afghanistan. And I want that life, but I cannot have it at the moment in Afghanistan under the Taliban regime. And it is sad, but I was lucky enough to leave the country and come to another country and start a new life. But it hasn't been easy, and I now realize what my parents went through when they had no chance but to go to another country. And I still remember the day we came back to Afghanistan. It was 2003. We were all happy. We bought our own land. My parents registered us at school. And there was some sort of joy that I cannot express it, but I had it in me because I knew this is a place that I don't need to leave and this is where I belong. But now it's not possible to have and to experience that feeling now. And I wish every girl in Afghanistan get and achieve what they deserve. Thank you so much, Mariam, for sharing your experience with us. If you would like to send us a voice message, simply go to kabulfalling.com and click on send us a voice message. We'll continue to share some of the best responses during the course of the show. Kabul Falling is a production of Project Brazen in partnership with PRX. It's hosted by me, Nilofar Hidayat. Bradley Hope and Tom Wright are executive producers. Sandy Smollins is the executive producer for Audiation. Our managing producer is Lucy Woods and Eileen Meacham is the producer. Susie Armitage is our co-producer and story editor. And Siddhartha Mahanta is our consulting producer. Our associate producers are Dan Shin Huang, Fatima Faizi, Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Curcio and Neha Wadika. Additional reporting was done by Nigel Walker. Our translators are Hassan Azimi and Mahibullah Shadan. Arsen Fahim composed the original theme music. Sound design, musical scoring and mixing by Brad Stratton. Cover design by Ryan Ho and Jane Zisman. Embroidery by Women of Kandahar Treasure. Additional audio and video by Nicholas Brennan, Megan Dean and KK. With special thanks to Clayton Swisher. For more information on the people featured in this podcast and additional interviews, visit kabulfalling.com. Audiation.